Okay, we're on. Uh, good evening. My name is Jonathan Ratcliffe, and today I'm going to be giving a little talk about uh, an obscure but very interesting 15th century Platonist called Georgios Yemistos Plithon, Byzantine Platonist, medieval Greek, uh, or Renaissance Greek. <laughs> and uh, uh, this talk was originally intended to be given live in person, like in meet space, back on the 6th of April, but due to the uh, current circumstances of the, the great bat pox, uh, sadly we have been unable to uh, meet. So I believe I'm probably right now coming at you from the Bendigo Philosophical Society webpage, where there should also be an accompanying essay, which is rather long and has fancy things, what like references and that, because I've been meaning for quite a while now to write something proper on this fellow Plithon. Uh, okay, I think we will start like this. Now, a few weeks ago, I was talking to a friend on the internet, as, as you do, <clears throat> and we were talking about Renaissance Platonists. Over the past year or so, a hobby of mine has been trying to read up on as many of the obscure early modern Platonic thinkers as possible. Uh, I've sort of been working my way backwards from the Cambridge Platonists of the 17th century, Henry Moore, Ralph Cudworth, uh, Lady Anne Conway, back into the Middle Ages. And uh, I've been spending quite a bit of time reading up on people like Pico della Mirandola and Marsilio Ficino, uh, Nicholas of Cusa and others. And I was talking to my friend about a couple of these. And then I decided, well, after a while, that it was around about the appropriate time to uh, ask the, uh, the, the, the big quattro punk 15th century hipster question, which is, what do you think of Plethon? Uh, to which my friend responded that he thought that Plethon represented the absolute best and abject bloody worst of the Hellenic tradition and the Greek tradition. Uh, now, I don't think that my friend was being necessarily, uh, he, well, he was hedging his bets on this, nor do I think he was engaging in some kind of platonic platitude. I think the fact is that once you know a bit about Plethon, uh, then you can't be tepid about him. You end up having to try and work out whether you think that he was either a genius or whether it was proper insane. Um, over the past hundred years, not an awful lot has been written about him. He is indeed obscure. Uh, proper intellectual hipster material. And before then, in the centuries prior, uh, even less has been written about him. Yet in the past 10, 20 years, uh, quite a few books have begun to appear on, uh, on him. As some people have uh, begun uh, to, well, to go as far as to uh, suggest that <clears throat> he may be the first modern utopian thinker, that he uh, might be you know, the first uh, neo-pagan, uh, that he's Spinoza before Spinoza, and even, right, that he might be, from coming from the other direction, the last of the Hellenes, as though uh, he, right at the end of the Byzantine Empire in the 15th century, may have been the last proper Greek uh, classical Hellenic thinker. Uh, now, uh, the small modicum of fame to the three or four people who've noticed Plethon of late uh, has been these extremely eccentric ideas. Uh, principally, what seems to be his the rejection of the Neoplatonic Orthodox Christian Greek uh, philosophical frame into which he was born and educated in favour instead of an attempt to uh, revive ancient Greek polytheism. And as well as that, uh, also his very interesting political ideas. Now, Plethon uh, wrote a couple of memoranda, as they're called, memos, to uh, the uh, then <coughs> Byzantine emperor at the time, Manuel uh, II, Palaio Logos, and to his brother, the despot of Mistra. Mistra is in the Peloponnese, and where Plethon spent most of his life. And uh, Theodore, you know, the guy, the despot of Mistra, Theodore was a brother of Manuel Palaio Logos. And he wrote these memos to them saying, basically, Hey guys, why don't we uh, finish fixing up the Hexamillion Wall, the big wall that seals off the uh, Peloponnese and as a sort of the peninsula beyond the Isthmus of Corinth. And 
try and turn the Peloponnese into Plato's Republic in real life. Okay, so this guy is proper eccentric. Uh, Neo-pagan polytheist, you know, revivalist type uh, in the 15th century and uh, trying to convince important people to go and make Plato's Republic. Ah, uh, right. Yeah, so we will get into this in detail in, in two sections. The first on the uh, metaphysics and ontology of Plethon, and second on the politics. And um, we will, I fear, in the first section, have to talk about the great ice cream headache of ontology. The uh, ontology being the branch of philosophy uh, to do with the question of being. That emptiest yet most all-important of questions, as Heidegger famously put it. Uh, the being of beings is not itself a being, and so on. If, if you've got that far into this sort of thing and gone, oh shit, then we have some bad news. But I promise we will be nice and gentle. Uh, in this talk, if you go and read my essay, it's a bit more heavy-like. <laughs> uh, but we do need to explain some of this stuff in order to uh, then further explain uh, what Plethon was doing and why it annoyed his contemporaries so much uh, that in fact it was that not merely his polytheism but also his ontology perhaps that caused them to burn one of his, well, his main work called the Nomoi or Laws. And it only remains, thanks to one of his students, Bessarion, a syngraphe, or draft, of the contents of the laws. And the fact is that it may have been, likely, another one of his students who actually did the burning, called Scholarius. As Scholarius be, had become, became um, uh, the patriarch of the uh, Orthodox, Byzantine Orthodox Church. Uh, and the first patriarch, in fact, under... Uh, Turkish rule, because the fact is that, well, good old Plethon, uh, he, uh, he was to pass away in probably around about 1452, which is the uh, year before uh, Johnny Turk uh, invaded Constantinople, causing it, in the immortal words of the song, to be somewhere where you can't go back to no more. Um, so, uh, yes, so this, this particular polytheistic text, with uh, we'll talk about the ontology in a bit, um, was provocative enough in order to be burned. Uh, all right. So I think, first of all, though, however, we need a bit of a background on, on, on Plethon's life. His, his real proper surname is not Plethon. It's Yorios Yemistos was his name. I think that's how you would have said it back then. Um, and, uh, or George, we could call him, I presume. <laughs> but um, he was yeah, born Yorios Yemistos into a fairly well-to-do uh, Byzantine Greek family in somewhere between 1355 and 1360. We're not quite sure. I mean, in the same way as I just said before, he likely died in 1452. Some people think it was slightly later. But anyway, somewhere between 1355 and living to 1452 is a bloody good innings, if I say so myself. He lived a long life, and it was a life during which uh, he was very, very, very well respected indeed. He was work was only burned after he died. He was a pretty influential uh, and well-regarded fellow. Um, so, uh, uh, well, as he grew up, um, Yorgos Yemistos was sent off to Constantinople to get a proper education. And thereafter, he was sent to Adrianopolis, which was a uh, big, important centre of learning that had fallen to the Turks uh, around about... Uh, 1365, 1365 generally, yeah, is the proper date, and uh, about five years or slightly more after um, Yemistos's birth, and it had been a, cent a center of learning, and it now became uh, an is Islamified center of learning, which had absorbed lots of influences from all over the Islamic world. Uh, it was still a pretty important place, a cool place for a young Greek fellow to get an education, and there. Uh, Plethon met a guy called uh, Eudaeus Elisaios, uh, who taught him about Zoroastrianism. But Elisaios soon got himself burned at the stake for heresy. So, uh, Eumistos decided it was time to move on. He went and travelled a bit, and then he came back to Constantinople, where his uh, big brain uh, soon uh, you know, caused him to rise to the level of being a, a well-respected teacher of philosophy, and also a senator. 
are a mainline ispravit. Uh, sometime early in the 15th century, we're not exactly sure when, <coughs> he uh, seems to have, it seems to have been suggested by uh, Manuel II Palaiologos, the emperor, that he should go and serve the uh, court of his brother Theodore, the despot of Mistra. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it used to be suggested at least that <coughs> this was because Cleothon had done something naughty. Uh, though I'm not sure exactly these days if people would agree on that. As I said, he was generally very highly regarded during his, uh, his most of his life. And uh, he, in Mistra, he served in lots of important, uh, not only academic, but also government and administrative positions. And uh, <clears throat> he was so well regarded that in 1438 or 1439, that he was one of the guys chosen to go all the way out to Italy to the uh, Conference of Florence, which was part of an ongoing sort of series of debates trying to get the uh, Latin Western Church and the Eastern Churches, including the big Orthodox uh, Byzantine Church, to uh, sort of, you know, come back together again and to make up their differences. And, and he was chosen, Eumistus Plithon, to go and speak on behalf of the uh, Orthodox Church and to say that it was superior and very cool. Now, the thing is that uh, while he was there, it appears that he also did some other stuff. Uh, there was a very, one of the, one of the sort of popular stories that is, sort of was circulated. It comes from uh, an introduction to uh, Latin translation of Plotinus' Aeneids, the first proper modern uh, trans Latin translation by Marsilio Ficino, the great Florentine Platonist, in which it said that uh, the only reason that Cosimo de' Medici, one of the great you know, Medici rulers of Renaissance Florence, had uh, built his, uh, well, famous... Uh, new Platonic Florentine Pl Platonic Academy was because uh, Cosimo heard uh, Plethon discourse on Plato and was was so incredibly uh, impressed by it. Now, in the past couple of decades, people have doubted the veracity of this story uh, for a couple of reasons. One, Ficino never met Plethon himself. Two, Ficino didn't like Plethon very much. And three, there's no evidence that Cosimo ever met Plethon. But uh, or also the possibility that the um, uh, the academy itself never even existed. No, uh, for for all us quattro punk um, 15th century Platonic fans, that's a bit of a blow. Uh, but uh, the thing is that um, also while he was there, there was another fellow who'd gone out to uh, Italy with them, a uh, well, Greek called George of Trebizond, who records that he remembers. Uh, Plethon saying uh, one day when they were all having a nice chat, uh, one day very soon, a, um, though everyone in the world, I think, will believe in a single religion. And when George asked Plethon, uh, well, would it be Christ's religion or Mohammed's? Plethon said, no, no, I think it will be something uh, much closer to paganism. And at this, uh, George of Trebizond was so offended that he decided that he properly hated Plethon, and regard him thereafter as a viper, I seem to remember that it's said. Uh, we'll be coming back to this quote at the end of the talk, because uh, George of Trebizond himself had some pretty bizarre, uh, possibly pretty bizarre, uh, political theories like Plethon, slightly different. Um, so anyway, uh, the, the, uh, ex the, the uh, erudite uh, listener may uh, have come across reference to the uh, Platonic Academy in Florence and Plethon's influence on it before. Uh, also, uh, said listener may also be uh, familiar with the, there's a mention of Plethon, one of the few in the last uh, few hundred years, in uh, the 23rd canto, I believe, of Ezra Pound's cantos, in which Yamisto and Pselos, Michael Pselos, another Byzantine philosopher, are mentioned, complaining about the Italians. Go and look it up. It's proper modernist Ezra Pound stuff. It's quite interesting. Uh, but, yeah, so this is sort of the <clears throat> the Western perspective on, on or the basic one anyway, on uh, Plethon. But how did he come, if he was born Iorios Eumistos, to be called Plethon? Plethon means, in Greek, full. But Eumistos also means full in Greek. So it's quite possible that he just took up this name as his cool philosopher name, uh, on the basis of just a similar a similar meaning word. 
Uh, but also, Plethon is rather like Platon, Plato, and it's quite possible, him being a massive fan of Plato, that that's why he adopted the name. But there's also the possibility that just as Plato's name, Platon, uh, is actually a nickname that stems from the fact that <coughs> Plato was a rather husky fellow, a big, a big boy, a wrestler, a um, bit of a boofer, that uh, Plethon too, that his name was in reference to the fact that he had a big physique. For instance, in the 1760s, when uh, Plethon's sarcophagus in, uh, was opened up, it had been transported in about the 1460s from uh, Greece to Italy by an Italian admirer of him. Uh, when it was opened up in the 1760s, apparently the skull was very, very big. He was a big, big-headed, big-brained fellow indeed. A sip of wine. All right, uh, we will continue. I, I do apologize, but it appears that my audience has fallen asleep. Uh, Mrs. Ratcliffe over here. Anyway, we shall continue. So let's let's talk about Plethon's philosophy. Uh, Plethon, in order to understand his philosophy, in particular his ontology, we, we, we need to go all the way back to Parmenides, the first Greek philosopher who lifted up the question of being, the uh, question of ontology. And um, because Plethon himself was a big fan of Parmenides, and it's to Parmenides' ontology that he, uh, that he turned, because he was quite convinced that that was Plato's real ontology, that he agreed with Parmenides. And I think quite a lot of uh, listeners who are students of the uh, late Roger Sorda would be quite interested in this. I imagine Roger himself would have been as well. I don't know if he knew much about Plethon. Uh, anyway, so uh, Parmenides uh, basically claimed that being, uh, existence, is, is one. Uh, one great big trivial thing, and that non-being, a neg negation of stuff, uh, is impossible. It's a contradiction in terms. There cannot not be non-being and so on. Uh, it gets very tangled. And uh, so Parmenides' conception of existence is a great big as I said, trivial one, where everything that can be thought actually is. Now, uh, Plato, who was very strongly influenced by Parmenides, on the other hand, uh, Plato's, contrary to what Plethon seems to have thought, had a whole, Plato actually had a whole lot of different ont ont ontological experiments going on. For instance, famously in the Timaeus, uh, Plato demarcates the difference between permanent being and mutable becoming, the changeable things uh, that come into and go out of existence. Also, for that matter, in the Parmenides, the dialogue named after the uh, great Eleatic philosopher Parmenides from Italy, the uh, Plato has the old Parmenides come and school the heck out of the young Socrates and demolish an early version of his theory of forms, and having done that, then uh, to go on and give some extremely convoluted and abhorric uh, hypotheses to do with whether being and the one and the same and the different and the many and so on, how they are the same and how, well, how they differ from one another. And this uh, great big crazy mess uh, was to strongly influence what was later to become in late antiquity Neoplatonism. The Neoplatonic mystics like Plotinus and Proclus believed that God, or the One, was far above being, that God is beyond being. Plato himself in the Republic had said that the form of the good, in, uh, which is like the sun in how it sheds its light and illuminates everything and makes things knowable, is uh, I am beyond being. And this influenced the Neoplatonists too. So they saw that rather than it being just one big being, like Parmenides had said, that there is a difference between the one. You know, the one is beyond being. And this was to influence very deeply Christian mysticism, both in the Latin West and in the Greek East during the Middle Ages, where mystics were to emphasise that the, uh, there was a profound difference between worldly existence and a totally alien, transcendental God. Uh, this, of course, would start to develop problems as to how did this God make the world? How did God and creation interact with one another? And yes, indeed, there's uh, 
lots of problems and quite a headache with this sort of stuff. Uh, but to return to Plato, excuse me, Plato uh, had also, in another dialogue called the Sophist, often regarded as his final dialogue, uh, gone and deliberately disobeyed Parmenides. He has a character called the Eleatic Guest or Stranger uh, say, all right, we're going to disobey both Parmenides and the, so and the Sophists, and we're going to take the existence of non-being seriously. And that is a dialogue I'm quite interested, especially at the moment, in. And uh, this is one which has had only sort of a limited influence on the history of philosophy, though of in the late 20th century, I think we could get both uh, Gilles Deleuze and Alain Badiou uh, went back to it and said some interesting things about it, of course. But um, in this dialogue, there's Plato saying that, yeah, let's take non-being seriously, which is quite different from Platon's belief, when we will come to it, that Plato only believed uh, that there was being, there is nothing outside of being, and that being is one. <coughs> Uh, because, as we'll see, Pluton borrowed quite strongly from certain parts of the Sophist, but he just completely blanked uh, the fact that that dialogue is all about non-being. Anyway, so, as we were, heading back to the Middle Ages, we were talking about Neoplatonic Christian mysticism and its uh, need to distance a totally transcendental god, her one, from the world. And, uh, as we said, this sort of caused problems as to how they were to interact. And when Aristotle's ideas came along, these were trying to, were kind of mixed in to this sort of stuff. Aristotle, in comparison with Plato, Aristotle had said that we use the term being in many different senses. It is an equ equivocal term. Uh, we use it in different ways. We say that something is, that it is a certain thing, that it is indeed something, and... Aristotle gives a whole lot of different, more than 10 or so, ways in which we use being differently. And so this was plugged by scholastics, uh, our medieval Aristotelians, into their idea that the being of God is equivocal or different from the being of the world. When we use the term being, we don't mean the same thing. And Thomas Aquinas uh, was the most famous scholastic who, who uh, tried to sort of heal the I suppose the gap between the being of the world and <clears throat> the totally <clears throat> transcendental God by uh, saying that God is uh, being in itself or you know, highest being and that beings, creatures, God's creation, participate <clears throat> in that. So Aquinas understood uh, what is, you know, often, you know, regarded as, say, with Heidegger famously called the ontological difference, the difference between being and beings. And Heidegger, of course, completely blanked that, as with the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. Um, <clears throat> but that's a different story. However, uh, against Aquinas, a guy called Dun Scottus comes along slightly later, and he says... Well, no, I think the being of God is the same sort of thing as the being of the world. It's just that God is more being, uh, uh, so to speak. That um, it is a, simply a difference of degree and not of kind. That being is univocal. And maybe if there are some Deleuze fans listening, they'll be familiar with the concept, or vaguely at least, uh, of the university of being. And that's that it's the same being whether, you know, for everything, the same sort of existence. It's just that, to Dun Scott, at least, God is more existier, then we're doing it again, or than creatures. It's just a difference of degree. Now, <clears throat> it's at this point, finally, that Plethon comes along. And Plethon basically was a major defender of... Uh, or well, the major defender amongst the Byzantines, uh, of the concept of the university of being, but in a Parmenidean sense. He accused Aristotle for suggesting that being was equivocal, for bringing chaos and disorder into being, um, that there would be no coherence between God and the rest of the world if uh, being meant different things. How would everything fit together and work? Which is a pretty reasonable point. So instead... Uh, Plethon says that, yes, it's all just the same kind of being. And uh, now, the fact is that to the Neoplatonic Christian philosophers of the time, 
this is actually a pretty uh, dangerous idea as uh, <clears throat> so far as they thought about things because it might seem to mean that God and the world were not so different. It might threaten to, you know, do horrible things like make people worship nature and idols and all sorts of things. And if Clifford had merely stopped at this point, he would have just sort of been a kind of interesting Parmenidean Dun Scotus. Uh, really? And, uh, oh, interesting fun fact, supposed fun, fun story at least, Dun Scotus' name, uh, you know, supposedly gives us the word dunce because a lot of people thought that he was bloody stupid. Uh, but, to return to the point, um, yeah, if Plithon had merely said the being of uh, God and of the rest of creation is exactly the same stuff and God just exists more than the world, uh, then, yeah, he might have, people might have thought that he was, a, you know, call, called him all kinds of things like an idolater and I don't know and so on, but uh, that would have been that. It's the next step that he took that is the naughty one. And it was that he decided, Clifford did in his nomoi or laws, uh, and the Syncrafeo draft that we have left seems to suggest so, that uh, <clears throat> that being in itself, this great one Parmenidean being, should uh, he should regard it as under the name of the pagan god Zeus. This is the big thing, the repaganization of this stuff. Uh, and he says that Zeus is the one in itself, a good in itself, the true in itself, uh, and so on, which are all scholastic sort of attributes of God. And there is nothing outside of this great big one. And, uh, however, Clithon does then engage in a system or a sort of skeleton of existence within Zeus or being, and the different parts are named after other ancient Greek pagan gods. And it gets very interesting at this point because it's, it's quite original. Uh, now, um, this is, yeah, this is, this is the naughty bit when you start saying that God, instead of the Christian God, is actually Zeus. Now, uh, Plithon, after Zeus, he has what he calls seven important gods or seven important philosophical principles that structure uh, the existence within Zeus or being. And these are potentiality, or oh, hang on, no, we'll, we'll start with the, with the first main one instead. I think we'll start with what he calls Poseidon. And Poseidon represents nous, or intellect, very important for Platonists, and actuality. Actuality is an Aristotelian principle. It means the, basically the ability to get stuff done, that which causes things to be brought about. After that, the next one is, as we were saying, uh, Potentiality, another important Aristotelian principle, which is the possibility of something being triggered or happening, latent in things. Uh, virtuality is another uh, name for it in medieval philosophy. And he calls potentiality Hera, right? the goddess Hera. Thereafter, he has sameness, which he calls Apollo. He has difference, which he calls Artemis. Right? He has rest, which he calls Hephaestus. He ha and then he has two different kinds of motion. He has Dionysus as self-movement, and then he has uh, Athene as movement due to an external cause. Now, this splitting of movement into self-movement or movement from within, a movement by something outside making you move, uh, is once again an Aristotelian, uh, part of Aristotelian cosmology. Now, Plithon was pretty much educated, like a lot of you know, uh, Renaissance Platonists, as a scholastic with Neoplatonic aspects, he then just stacked Plato on top of this. Um, now, there are a couple of different things to be said about this. It's like, why is he calling these principles gods and so on? Well, there is a tradition already inherent in Hermetic and, uh, and uh, Neoplatonic literature of representing uh, the cosmos as basically a theogonous product of a product of certain divine principles named after the uh, pagan gods. For example, in the Chaldean oracles, on which Plethon famously wrote a uh, commentary, and he may have been responsible for people in the Renaissance thinking that it was Zoroastrian, that it was attributed to Zoroaster, um, Zarathustra. The, um, in that, for example, you have a first intellect, intellect 
which is produces a its son as the second intellect, which is rather like Zeus, a man, Poseidon. And there's also produced a, another entity called Hecate, rather like Hera, as the sort of basis of the world soul. Uh, there's also, in a uh, very pl a, uh, popular <coughs> Orphic text from the Middle Ages called the Sacred Discourse of the 24 Rhapsodies, you have Kronos, Rhea, and Zeus as the three main sort of philosophical principles. But a very interesting uh, suggestion was made by Henry Corbin. I believe Rod Blackhurst may know about this. Uh, Henry Corbin was uh, one of the was an uh, expert on on Sufism, particularly Platonic aspects of Sufism, and the first French translator of Heidegger. And he suggested that while he was being educated in Adrianople uh, in the Islamic sort of world, the young the young Pluton may have absorbed some ideas that were getting around that had belonged to the Sufi, Plat Platonic Sufi Surawadi, in which there is a first being from which proceeds a unique separate light. Now, these are all very interesting and may have in, uh, influenced uh, Pluton's bizarre system, but uh, the fact is that the majority of the concepts, as we've already seen some of them are Aristotelian, but of those seven important gods, actually come from the Platonic dialogue we mentioned earlier, which is Plato's Sophus, the one in which Plato takes the idea of the existence of non-being seriously. And in that dialogue, Plato talks about the five most important things. There is being, and then there is uh, motion and rest, now, we've already heard about the two different kinds of motion and also rest in Pluton. And there's also uh, sameness and difference or otherness. And those are all there in Pluton's thing too. But as we said, the, the Sophist dialogue is about taking non-being seriously. Plato uses non-being in about five or six different sort of meanings as existent non-being. Plato, so it would seem, had discovered the equivocity of non-being, but not the equivocity of being, that Aristotle mentions, as we've already talked about. And yeah, the Sophist is a very interesting dialogue. But So it's as though Plifon is stealing the, in, the infrastructure out of that dialogue, the five most important things, uh, but then pretending that it has nothing to do with non-being. And as to how he would have gone about thinking this and rationalising it is a total mystery. Uh, it's, it's fascinating. But anyway... That's, that's certainly not the end to what Pluton's ontology was about. Thereafter, there are several more <coughs> different sections. Uh, Pluton next has a, uh, a section which is about astral nature and corporeal nature, in which he has an astral nature uh, the, uh, in, and corporeal nature, a whole lot of what's basically the, the titans in Greek mythology. Astral nature is Atlas, the planets, uh, Tithonus, the fixed stars, Dione, demonic nature, Hermes, the human soul, um, is uh, Hades. Then we have in corporeal nature, the Titaness Rhea. Then we have ether and heat, Leto, air and cold, Hecate, water and flow, Tethys, another Titaness, and earth and salubrity, the uh, goddess Hestia, the goddess of the, uh, of the hearth. And um, <clears throat> what's interesting is that Plethon talks about those seven important deities, the first ones, and these titans, he, he talks about them not just as giving a nice big chart or a list, he talks about them through a series of prayers to them. And this is the thing that's, that's uh, kind of likely what really incriminated him, because he says, There's, let's write out a whole lot of prayers about this, and um, um, then he starts talking about, well, I'll have these prayers, you know, said at different times of different days of different months of the year. And he goes talking about what, you know, they'll be said in these special pagan temples. And uh, they'll be using these different kinds of Greek melodies like Dorian and Hypodorian and so on. So he really thought it out. It sounds a lot like Plato's Republic or Plato's Laws talking about... Uh, music and cosmology and religion trying to sync up with the universe. It doesn't seem that something like this was simply a matter of what the Byzantines called Lexus, which is basically just playing around with ancient models because they sounded cool. The Byzantines had uh, preserved ancient Greek historians and poets and philosophers because they wanted to make, well, their own uh, 
history writing, their own poetry, and their own Christian philosophy sound really cool. So you save the best stuff. Similar things happened in the Latin West. I mean, for God's sake, why did Pliny the Younger, that utter sycophant, why did his work survive? Because he wrote sycophantic letters, and lots of vicars thought it would be really cool to write sophisticated sycophantic letters. But enough complaint about Pliny the Younger. Cliffon's uh, talks about, you know, he has that first category of, uh, of uh, the seven important gods, followed by these astral and corporeal uh, natured gods who are basically titans. But um, the fact is that as the astute listener has probably grasped already and maybe shouting about, uh, hang on, Poseidon isn't the son of Zeus, and all these children aren't children of Zeus, and what the heck, you know, no, this isn't like ancient Greek theogony and the history of the gods at all. It, it really isn't. Uh, and it gets even weirder when we find in the third section of Principles, um, those uh, entities or, or deities and titans uh, who are ruled by time, which is Kronos. And Plethon says in one of his prayers that Kronos, or Saturn, as you may know from <clears throat> the Latin conversion or the Roman conversion is the son of Zeus. And just about anyone who spent five minutes reading about ancient Greek mythology knows that, hang on, it's the other way around. Uh, Zeus is the son of Kronos. But Plethon's taking it the other way around. He seems to be representing these titans, particularly, as lower entities. Um, you start with Zeus, the big guy, and everything under him is kind of more illegitimate and lesser, and, Pl and, and Plethon uses the term illegitimate descendants, etc., quite a lot, which, of course, in ancient theog theogonic literature was very important. That's where all the monsters and so on in Greek tradition come from. But he doesn't say how this illegitimate begetting of these other principles of deities took place. The fact is, though, because he's rejected non-being from his system, and traditionally in Neoplatonism, in order to have a big series of principles leading from God as the one at the top all the way down to uh, human beings and plants and matter and stuff at the bottom, you needed to have a thing called the diminution of being. The further down you get, the more non-being there is, um, and the less existent things are, right? Uh, but because he's rejected non-being, instead he just says, dials up legitima Ill illegitimacy the further down you go, without explaining it. And he's tr it's as though Clifon is trying to make up for the lack of uh, non-being in his system without explaining it. So, anyway, under Kronos' time, we come to, quite interestingly, all the way, we're pretty low already in the scheme of things, Aphrodite presiding over or representing reproduction. Now, the most interesting thing about Plethon's system is that you don't, don't have a higher and lower Aphrodite or higher and lower Eros at all. Uh, it's as though simply Aphrodite is consigned to mere animal reproduction down the bottom. And instead, reading through the uh, prayers, I uh, was the other day of the Syngrate or the Draft of the Laws. There's a copy in French I found. <laughs> from 1865 online. Uh, there is hardly any of Plethon primary material in English whatsoever. Uh, is that he, <coughs> excuse me, uh, is that he files basically what we regard as in Platonism, the higher form of, uh, of desire, the higher form of eros, uh, you know, to be, the, to be one with God, with, he actually files that underneath Dionysus, because Dionysus presides over self-movement, so like movement from within, the soul, as though the inherent nature of the soul is to reach out towards better things, and he says that that is what Dionysus does, uh, in, and creates in man. So he's, he's re removed the, uh, the idea of Eros, so the higher Eros and the lower Eros, which was so important for Renaissance Platonists, Giordano Bruno and Marsilio Ficino, and, uh, and Pico della Mirandola, and just sandwiched it into Dionysus. So we can move Aphrodite all the way down to just mere animal reproduction as part of, uh, ruled by time. And we also have Pan ruling animal nature, Deme Demeter ruling the nature of plants, this is to be expected sort of stuff, and Persephone ruling just human mortal nature. We're getting low on the scheme of things. Um, but there, as we go down, uh, we then get as though these systems are now repeated. We've had 
the astral nature and corporeal nature and those sort of reproduction ruled by time as principles, it's now we get them as sort of actualities. We then get sort of the sun, moon and planets, we get the fixed stars, we get the demons, then we get humans, animals, plants, and then pure dead matter. So we've had higher principles responsible for creating these things, and then we're getting the actual things right down the bottom, illegitimate. And so the rash, you know, from human beings, animals, plants, and matter are all illegitimate. The sun, and you know, and the moon, and the planets, and the fixed stars, and the demons who belong to that sort of world of, you know, uh, superlunary world traditionally in Platonism are legitimate. Uh, so we have the higher principles then reflect as reflected in <clears throat> a sort of lower particular actualities. So we've got something which is in a way quite a typical Neoplatonic system of sort of emanations, as they're often called, series of, of levels going down, but without non-being. And this makes Platon a highly original thinker, his total rejection of the diminution of being. But as we have said, with the weird inclusion of illegitimacy. So he is creating a generative logic, but it's also a genealogical logic using these gods and titans in a ways they were not traditionally related in antiquity. <clears throat> the question then, the big burning question, the five million dollar question, is whether Plithon believed in these gods as gods. The prayers and the idea of having a whole cycle of the year in which there would be holy days to different ones seems to suggest that he took them seriously. And that contrary to some people, particularly say uh, Niketas Siniosoglu, who wrote a very cool book on Clithon back in 2011 called Radical Platonism in Byzantium, and which I'm highly indebted to in order to give this talk, basically thinks that Clithon <coughs> uh, only really was interested, it was the henotheism, only interested in Zeus qua being. He's not interested in the other ones. But seeing that he's got this whole civic religion set out and this whole calendar, he even converts the calendar into a series of 29 day months. He goes and totally rejigs the calendar. It's as though he did take them seriously. They're all supposed to be celebrated as part of the cycle of the year. Uh, I don't think that Zeus Qua Bang sets the ontology and is the most important, yes. But the other ones are important too. And it is hard to work out whether he just thought of this was a cute way of of saying a bunch of there's a bunch of philosophical principles or whether he really believed in them as gods i mean if you look at his prayer to athene for instance he believes in her not just as the principle as of motion due to external cause he he, he says that uh you know he regards her also as being responsible for sort of the parsimonious and 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 prudent nature of creation uh both in the creation of the world and in philosophical thought in the individual mind of philosophers, that she's responsible for that. So there's some elements still of her traditional role, as well as this other principle that he's um, uh, caused her to be fitted into because he needed, uh, so it seems, uh, Greek gods' names for these philosophical principles borrowed from Aristotle and from Plato's sophist. So I think they were supposed to be taken seriously as gods, um, it's very interesting. <clears throat> anyway, we'll have a little more wine. I must say at this point that we're 43 minutes in. And, uh, gosh, it has been uh, quite a day to try and get this recorded. I've tried four or five times. In fact, my friend Christopher uh, called earlier from England. And this is about my fifth attempt to record this talk. And I said, get in the bloody sea to him because I was uh, so fed up with trying to make different attempts. But uh, it was very nice to talk to him anyway. And <laughs> so uh, we will have this slight break for a moment before we shall talk about what maybe is, you know, the side effects or the possible meaning of what Plithon was doing with his system. Uh, now, we mentioned just before the Niketas Siniosoglu and his book Radical Platonism in Byzantium, in that, uh, well in that book there's some pretty crazy big claims made uh, that Plithon is the, uh, is the sort of a first modern thinker. He's got this, uh, the term that Siniosoglu uses is uh, epistemological optimism about him that makes him different from Neoplatonic Christian thinkers at the time, that he expects 
the Enlightenment. And when this sort of thing is said, I mean, the most obvious thing seemed to me reading over the syngraphe of the laws and the anomaly was that thinking about the French Revolution, for example, where the cult of reason, where they decided to rename all the days of the week and all the months and so on. And uh, that's pretty much what Platon is doing. Uh, but what Sunio Sokola, who doesn't mention that stuff, seems to be getting at is this idea that because of the equivocity of being and the alien nature of God compared with the world is that Byzantine Christianity, and even he says Christianity completely, has this deprecatory uh, attitude towards human knowledge. Uh, it's that human knowledge is limited. It can't possibly understand this alien God. It can't possibly understand all of the things that are and are beyond being. Um, that it is limited and that only faith will do. So, uh, Simeon Sokolu says that he, he goes this far, he goes, uh, he basically says, I'm fed up with all this postmodern uh, nominalism. He says there is, an, there is an essentialist, essentialist indeed, essentialist difference between pagan and Christian ontology, he says. In which pagan ontology, like Plithon and Plato, believed that human beings could, you know, with optimistic, they could know everything, and that being is completely one, and there's this Christian ontology instead, which sees that human intellect is bad, and it can't really know an awful lot, and that there's it's an ontology of being, and that which is beyond being. And this seems, it's, 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 this guy knows a lot about Plethon and Byzantine stuff. He's pretty much the guy who wrote the book. In fact, he did write the book, the Cambridge Guide to uh, Byzantine Intellectuals, or thereabouts, on, um, on Byzantine philosophy. He pretty much turned Byzantine, uh, uh, the, created the idea of Byzantine uh, philosophical studies as its own category into a real thing. I mean, it's very small, the study of Byzantine history and philosophy and religion and stuff in general compared with, uh, you know, the studies of classical antiquity, Greek antiquity, for instance. But anyway, so this guy is saying that there's this essential difference between pagan and Christian ontology. But this is a bit nuts. As we've already seen, um, Plato uh, himself didn't really have a, you know, didn't, there was nothing like Parmenides' understanding of that being is just one. Um, we've already talked about Plato's sophist and the kind of headache of Plato's dialogue called the Parmenides. And uh, the fact is that, let's have a little more wine. Yeah, in, in the sophist, um, Plato did take the equivocity of non-being seriously, and non-being in itself as a serious thing. But Sinio Sokolu says, oh, there's a couple of people have thought that when Plato had said in the Republic that the good is beyond being, that what this really meant uh, is that the good is just belongs to the extreme topmost part of being. And that Plotinus just misunderstood this. He says, middle Platonists understood it, even Plutarch understood that this is what that meant. But Plotinus goes out of his way to misunderstand this, and Plotinus therefore sort of is expecting uh, Christian uh, mysticism before it's even happened, right? Uh, now, yeah, this is this is a bit odd. Uh, one wonders what Simeon Sokolov would make of someone like the uh, Jesuit Parmenidean Emanuele Severino, who uh, the Pope and his mates told should really stop writing back in the 60s and 70s, because uh, this guy basically said that it was because Plato had inserted non-being into philosophy, that's where all Western nihilism had come from. So, Parmenogy and Jesus time. The, uh, go and, if you're, if, you're, if you're interested in some hardcore ontological ice cream headache, go and look up the, um, his book called The Essence of Nihilism. It is, it is real Parmenogy and Christian stuff. It's fascinating. One also wonders <coughs> uh, why, for example, Thomas Taylor, uh, who was a self-conscious anti-Christian uh, pagan Platonist in the 19th century, hated Plithon so much. Now, the name Thomas Taylor, some of you may be familiar with it because uh, Roger Sorder uh, was pretty big into Thomas Taylor, particularly his take on, on Porphyry and so on. And uh, now, a Thomas Taylor in his... Uh, 1812 book, their dissertation on the philosophy of Aristotle, gives over a couple of pages to talk about Plithon and some other Renaissance Platonists. And he says that, basically, 
that Blithon was a sellout because he'd given up on the the traditional idea that deep down Plato and Aristotle really agreed on everything. This is called the Symphonia, and it was a big thing in the Byzantine world and in the Latin Renaissance as well. They believed that deep down that um, Plato and Aristotle really agreed on things. And uh, Thomas Taylor believed that, and I remember Roger Sorter saying to me a couple of times that he believed that. That's the big traditional philosophical, Western philosophical thing. Plato and Aristotle, deep down, they agree on everything, even if they say things differently. It's a big call. Now, Thomas Taylor also says that, um, that Plithon, by making Zeus, or as he says, Jupiter, into the chief god in the Platonic system, this is totally not in agreement with anything that Plato ever said, and for that matter, what Zoroaster, what the Chaldean oracles ever said. It's not a Platonic idea, and so he censures Plethon for that and thinks that this is totally ridiculous. Uh, where, and then he says that in the Timaeus, Plato, of course, says that it's rather hard for normies, for average people, to understand things about the Demiurge and so on. The Demiurge, the creator, is opaque. Um, it can be understood by clever people. And Sinio Sokolu says, he misunderstands this, and seems to be saying, he says that, oh, look, there's this guy, Thomas Taylor, saying that he's censoring a... a uh, Plithon for his epistemological optimism and saying that, you know, God and everything can be known. And that seems to be missing the point. I think it's mentioning the Timaeus is just a kind of fun fact that uh, Thomas Taylor also included. But one thing that's missing from Plithon and from, uh, uh, yeah, and from consideration at all about epistemological optimism, in which a lot's been said in the 20th century, is about the hermetic tradition, about the, uh, the corpus of works accredited to the uh, fabulous Egyptian Hermes Trismegistus, Hermes the Thrice Great. And, uh, yeah, a lot was said in the 20th century by people like the Neo-Kantian Ernst Cassirer, and then also by, uh, by other people as well. Um, that uh, Eric Fogel and even that the idea is that modernity emerged out of this key notion in the Hermetica that the man, the human being, is a kind of god on earth, a kind of second god, and can know everything, which seems very similar to what Signor Sokolu seems to imagine Plethon saying, but Plethon doesn't seem to know about or talk about Hermes Trismegistus at all, and there's a lot that has been said about Marsilio Ficino and Pico della Mirandola and Nicholas Cusanus and people like that who were big in the Renaissance in Europe into the Hermetic tradition and their belief, basically, that the idea that humanism came out of the Hermetic tradition. And, um, and Giordano Bruno, too, this idea that the human being uh, is capable of knowing all these amazing things, everything from the top to the abject bottom of creation. Uh, because of uh, the, the, the man, due to his soul, who gives him, which in common with God, makes him a kind of second God. This isn't mentioned at all. But the important point should be that if Sinio Soklu seems to think that it was only due to this positive ontology that Plethon had, that there's no non-being, that there's only just this one complete being that's translucent, this Parmenidean sort of thing, that even though it's structured, as we've seen with all these other gods, um, is that there was a, a lot has also been said about Nicholas Cusanus, who, as we've just mentioned, he was a, uh, influenced by the Hermetic tradition, but he was also influenced by a very negative attitude, a negative theological attitude towards things. So uh, Cusanus was a German Platonist in the 15th century. He also went to Byzantium and he learned Greek and things like that. And he takes a negative theology, the idea that God is infinite and completely different from being. And he turns that imminently upon the world, Cusanus, Nicholas Cusa, does, and says that it's only by recognizing our own ignorance, what he calls a doctora, a non doctora, a doctor ignorantia, a learned ignorance, can we begin to understand our own limits um, and learn things. So it's by recognizing human limitation that we can begin to learn. And, and what happens is that Cusanus is in by imminently turning negative, you know, negative theology. He's saying that everything uh, in the human mind 
and in nature and even up to the angels is filled with otherness and with non-being and for this reason it cannot help but contradict we can't make a completely true statement about anything everything's always going to contain contradictions and it's actually this basis that for you know that is for that is formed from this that becomes the hegelian dialectic for instance yeah whereas everything contains its own imminent contradictions and negations the negation of the negation and so on uh that goes that hegel was basically a weird neoplatonist in a lot of ways and so the idea that they could just this that Sineo Soklu seems to have, or that there could just be this totally positive understanding that the whole world's translucent to human beings. It's also possible that due to a negative understanding of under, knowing one's ignorance and human limitation, that one can open up a kind of almost, I mean, Hans Blumenberg put it like, this infinite potentiality for future progress on the base that we could always be wrong about things. It's possible that a lot of scientific modern scientific understanding that only could come about by recognizing our own ignorance as Kusanas does, does and that influences both modern science and as we've said uh, later Hegel so in a lot of ways we could probably at the end of looking at uh, the metaphysics and ontology of Plithon think of him really as an maybe if Kusanas is an ancestor of Hegel that Plithon is an ancestor maybe of someone like Gilles Deleuze instead, or Spinoza, where you do not have, there's no, you do not permit negation within being, there's only uh, positivity. And of course the big divide in modern continental philosophy is between Hegelians and Deleuzeans. So maybe when uh, Gilles Deleuze uh, rather cheekily said, there has only been one ontological position, that of the university of being, from Heidegger, you know, not from, from Parmenides all the way to Heidegger, then perhaps at very least he should have had the decency to mention Plithon too. Even perhaps if it's very hard to prove that Plithon ever really influenced anyone. <sighs> all right. Now, we're running out of time. We're nearly at the hour mark. We will talk about Plithon's politics. We promised at the start, as we said, that Plithon wrote some uh, pretty provocative memos, memoranda, to the Byzantine Emperor Manuel, and also to the despot of Mistra in the Peloponnese in Greece, uh, whose uh, name was Theodore. Now, in these two memoranda, uh, Plithon sets out the idea of what's basically a platonic society, but strongly... Uh, was strongly influenced by Plato's Republic and Plato's laws. Uh, now, the fact is that we have to have a bit of context. By the, uh, in, after the, uh, you know, in the 1070s, 1071, I vaguely recall, of the Battle of Manzikert, all of Anatolia, modern Turkey, had fallen to the Turks. It had belonged to the Byzantines. And thereafter, the Byzantine Empire struggled on for a few hundred years before, as we've said, excuse me, at the start of this talk, in uh, 1453, Constantinople finally fell to the Turks. Now, Plithon is in the last century, and uh, in, you know, as we also mentioned, in 1365, even the city of Adrianopolis had fallen to the Turks. So it's a pretty desperate time, and it's desperate also because the Byzantine military was in disarray, they were highly dependent upon uh, it hired mercenaries to do things. Their taxation system was an absolute mess because they would just hand out, uh, you know, a tax exemption in perpetuity, you know, forever. The people, including Plithon himself, had basically was granted his family a um, remission from ever having to pay tax or any of their descendants ever again. And this sort of stuff takes its toll after a while. Uh, monastic communities, of course, didn't have to pay any tax either and they were pretty big in the centers of a lot of communities so the byzantine empire kind of needed a bit of money and it kind of needed a decent military pretty fast so in the early 15th century when the base uh, theodore started rebuilding the hexamillion wall it was a big wall for uh, a on the uh the uh, the isthmus from corinth and uh, the rest of the peloponnese excuse me, slightly more white, the um, Plithon seems to have taken in his head that it was around about time to send Theodore a memo uh, suggesting his uh, social reforms. 
And uh, that was probably about 1416 when he sent that. And 1418, I seem to recall, that he would have likely sent his other memo to the Emperor, uh, Manuel II Palaiologos. And these differ slightly, but they have pretty much the same spirit to them. And they're pretty out there. So <clears throat> one of the main things was that the need to divide society into three classes. And that's a very platonic concept. You might remember from the Republic the idea that there are the guardian class, Plato's Republic, there's the guardian class who are at the top and they're dominated by the rational part of the soul. In the middle there's the auxiliary soldiers who are dominated by the courageous part of the soul. And at the bottom there's just the workers and tradesmen and so on who are dominated by epitomia, which is the uh, appetitive part of the soul, the low desires. Uh, anyway, um... In the Manuel, uh, in the uh, mem the memo to uh, Theodore, there's you have at the top the Archicon Fulon, which is the ruling class, quite literally, and that's meant to be the uh, the judges and the administrators and the, and the uh, priests and so on, and these people run the system. It also would include so uh, Plethon said the king, but the king, of course, is not to be above the law. That's very interesting concept and much more could be said on that however we're running out of time uh, under in Theodore's in the memo to Theodore you have the merchants and the buyers and the sellers etc which of course in Plato's Republic Pla and also in the laws Plato tries to limit as much as possible Plato thinks that the people <coughs> importing stuff and you know fancy trinkets and luxuries uh, corrupt the population so he tries to limit things as much as possible and to make everything self-sufficient and closed off and that's also what Plethon believes that he rants against you know um, things like malachia softness and trufe luxuriance and uh, he just sort of expects the merchants and so on to serve the community that's the important thing uh, in the memo and down the bottom, though, however, the third class is called the Anangkayotaton, um, which is the most necessary class. And this represents the farmers and the herdsmen, the most necessary. And they are the most necessary because what Plethon really wanted uh, was to build a massive economic base in order to support a strong military state. Uh, so no wonder they're the most necessary, the most vital. And um, we'll get to a second on why and how he thought about reforming them. It's quite fascinating. But in the comparison, we've seen those three classes to Theodore. The three classes in the memo to Manuel are the Archicon, the ruling class we've already talked about. But instead of the merchants, you have the military. He wanted, Plethon wanted to have a military class in the middle in this particular memo. He thought it would be the best. But down the bottom is the most interesting one, which is instead of referring to the an Anchai or um, an Anchaiotaton, the most necessary class, he starts talking about helots. Now, the term helot comes uh, from, well, it's the name of the underclass of the ancient Spartans. And Sparta, of course, in ancient times, was in the Peloponnese region, which is where Pluton lived, and it's... Uh, also, the you know, it was, and uh, that's the region he wanted basically to be walled off and to become its own independent state. <laughs> but Helot, even in, in antiquity, had a really bad name. It was a boo word to Greeks because a lot of Greeks thought the way in which the Spartan warrior class treated Helots was disgusting. You could pretty much murder and rape them with impunity. And even when uh, uh, Plethon himself says, you know, I know this is a bad word, but I kind of want to bring it back, though. And, and in a lot of ways, I think the only reason we can understand why he would want to bring it back would be, be in order to connect to that legitimacy of ancient Sparta. We're going to do Sparta again, guys. Uh, so we've talked about the three classes in both of these memos. But now we need to talk about, yeah, as I said, especially the, the bottom class in each. And the, because the fact is that Plethon wanted the helots, or the most necessary class, to pay all the tax. And this might sound rather mean, but when we understand a little bit what he meant, it makes a bit more sense. Uh, what Plethon wanted to do was to get as much arable land cultivated as possible. So he decided that all land should be held in common. He says, just out of the blue, um, that uh, the way in which God made the world is such that all land belongs to all men. There's no such thing as private property inherently. And uh, some people have wondered whether this 
came from some ancient Stoic understanding of the Golden Age before there was society or something, which is, of course, an, or from Christian understanding of Eden or whatever. But, of course, that Stoic Golden Age myth had a lot of influence later uh, on people like Rousseau and Locke and the idea of the origins of uh, private property when they were writing during the Enlightenment. But uh, Pluthorne may have just taken it from the natural law tradition, which is also influenced by Stoicism a great deal anyway, in which is the idea that inherently at the beginning of things, there was no such thing as private property. So Pluthorne says, well, there might as well not be with regard to land, arable land anyway. Now, uh, so Pluthorne says anyone who wants to work some land, they can have it. And, but they'll lose it if they're really bad at it. So you can even hand it on to your kids. But if they lose interest or do a terrible job, they lose it and we'll give it to someone else. So he's basically collectivizing land, uh, but he's saying if you, you 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 can have it, you can run as much land as you like for herds or for growing crops, but if you do a terrible job, yeah, you're going to lose it because the aim is to grow as much stuff as possible in order to support the army. Plithon basically thinks that one guy working once a, a year could support one soldier. That's what he wants. And so, <clears throat> to return to the point on taxation, Plithon says that he thinks that, that it should be split into three as well. That you should have, uh, that the workers who work the land, they should set aside one third of their yearly earnings, or what they make, or what they produce, to pay for the, the capital of, to rent out things like um, vineyards or oxen for ploughing and so on. Uh, in order to, you know, make, you know, gather things and make their money. The, the last third should be set aside just to give to the military and the community. So it's not that bad, really. So you have uh, one third you keep for yourself. You have one third that you uh, use for paying for the stuff that you need. And then you have one third that you use for giving to the state, which is a lot better deal than what a lot of people had under the Byzantines anyway. And Plethon says that if people have their own oxen and stuff like that, then, well, they don't have to give any extra. They still only have to owe one third of what they make to the community as a whole. And Plethon's whole maxim is basically is that we want to be like an eagle. We don't want to be like a peacock. Is that he wanted a strong military state and big walls to keep out the Turks. And as we've already seen, he wanted merchants limited uh, to keep out, you know, softness and luxuriance. He's rather harsh on homosexuality, we, one might add. Um, he regarded it as a form of softness and that people should be burned at the stake for it. Uh, he's not interested, for that matter, as was Plato, on the position of women, that they could do the same jobs as men. Averroes, the Islamic uh, writer and commentator on Plato's Republic in comparison, uh, thought that it was rather sad that women in the Islamic world didn't get to do the same uh, work as men because it would be not only good for the economy, it would also be good for the intellectual life of the city or polis. Uh, but that's a different point entirely. Um, what Plithon really wants is as much land to be uh, cultivated as possible uh, to build a big stable army for keeping the Turks out. He's not interested in the memos on much more than that. Uh, there are a couple of other interesting things to add. One is that he never says, uh, for example, that the monasteries should have their land confiscated or whatever. Um, even though in other works he derides monks as being a bunch of lazy, useless drones, a cliche that goes back to Plato's laws and from there even to Hesiod's uh, uh, works and days about useless people being like drone bees. Um, is probably likely because the Emperor Manuel had recently given back a ton of land that had been confiscated from the monastery, so it wasn't a cool thing to suggest, hey, take away the monk's land. Um, as well as this, other things to add on uh, uh, Plithon's political memos is that, for instance, one of the big things is that he wanted gone was foreign currency, particularly foreign bronze currency, because it was devaluing the Byzantine currency. So. It's, he wants control of stuff. He sort of he wants control within the sort of closed off Peloponnesian walled peninsula. He wants control of uh, the army. He wants the land to be uh, collectivized. He wants to keep luxury luxuries out. He wants to keep foreign currency out. You have something which is 
quite Im immunological, a closed society, to use Karl Popper's problematic term. And so some people like Niketa Sinyasoglu have regarded uh, Plethon for the things that he suggests as the first nationalist thinker. Plethon's giving up on the massive ecumenical Byzantine Orthodox Empire that was falling apart. And even then, of course, the some of the Byzantine intellectuals were saying, ah, oh, man, give up on the empire and just think of Christ's kingdom in heaven instead. Uh, instead, well, rather that, the uh, Plethon's saying, no, man, just wall me up a bit uh, in the Peloponnese and I'll, we'll hold up there and we'll build a big army and we'll have a great economy, hey? Um, as to whether he intended it to ever be a pagan culture or whatever is uh, not mentioned, of course, in the memoranda, and it would be extremely debatable whether he imagined that his sort of little sealed-off bit would uh, eventually be do away with Christianity and do the things which he, in the nomoyal laws, he'd uh, thought about with all the temples and celebrating those uh, gods as principles and so on. But... Um, it is very interesting that Plethon's giving up on the, M the Byzantine Empire towards its end there. And he is in that small company of thinkers who have taken Plato's Republic seriously as advice, oh, and Plato's laws, as advice for their own age on how to, uh, on how to fix things up. As we mentioned just before, Averroes was another one. Averroes read Plato's Republic. He was actually originally, this is Averroes is, of course, Ibn Rushd of Cordova, the great uh, commentator on Plato and Aristotle, Arab commentator in the Middle Ages, who influenced a lot of uh, European philosophy. Uh, even in the 15th century, everyone in Padua was an Averroist. Uh, but, uh, you know, he read Plato's Republic and he goes, well, all the cities around here and all the recent rulers, they're not very good compared with the city in Plato's Republic. It really is the best society. We might not be able to make it. Whereas you've got Plithon instead saying, you know, I think this one that I've planned, we could make that. Everyone just has to believe in it, right? And they have to all work together. And anyone who doesn't want to work towards it, you know, and who's a bit, you know, stuck in stick in the mud, we'll have to use a spot of violence on them. But in good Platonic tradition, it must be violence that is controlled by reason. So maybe in some ways this might seem to reflect things that were to come in the Enlightenment, the French Revolution, the society, the rational violence, and so on, maybe Plethon really does look forward towards a kind of culture of civic nationalism, as people like uh, uh, Signor Sarkalou have claimed. Maybe he doesn't. He was, I think the, uh, the listener would need to make up their minds themselves and should also probably read my essay for more details on this. But he is very interesting. Maybe the only other thinker that many could that might come to mind to many, uh, might be Thomas More with his Utopia, which was written against the background of, he was a Platonist, More was, of the, uh, of the wool trade in England driving more and more people off the land, and also the, uh, dis the dis dissolution of the monasteries that turned the British peasantry into a floating proletariat, is that More said fa the famously that the sheep, once placid, had become a man-eating animal. And so he imagined Utopia, an island, pagan island, somewhere out in the New World, in which people lived in a rather platonic sort of manner. And some people have wondered whether Moore had read Plethon's work. There's not an awful lot of evidence for it, and they really don't share very much in common whatsoever. As we've said already several times, I believe, in this talk, there's not a lot of influence that... Plethon ever actually influenced anyone, but it still makes him a very interesting thinker, I believe, in the end. And maybe if he was the papa of immunised nationalism hiding itself in the corner, uh, that maybe today he has, you know, that in a world in which uh, neo-nationalism is on the rise, and even as we've seen the attitudes in dealing with the, uh, the current corona pandemic is that rather than some one world, let's all work together. Everyone has retreated to nation-state solutions. <laughs> Everyone's working on a different uh, uh, cure at once and so on. Is that maybe we are indeed heading towards a future of everyone hiding themselves in a corner a bit. <laughs> and in such a situation, uh, maybe there will be many thinkers who are vaguely like Plethon, who will have 
their own ideas of how to save the city. Because in the end, the most revolutionary thing that Pliton did, in Byzantine culture at least, was to change the idea of salvation away from the Christian salvation in heaven towards the idea of saving the city or the potential nation-state in the Peloponnese. Uh, Pel Peloponnese. And that's something very, very different. And today there's a lot of people rather panicked about what the future holds and their various communities and what it might be required to save them. And so perhaps, rather than the vague ideas that, that Pliton directly influenced modernity, is that coincidentally he uh, came up with things that other people came up with uh, of their own accord or through the influence of Plato and other classical thinkers much later on and which still continue to inform the world we live in today. Perhaps there is some kind of strange accidental rel you know uh, uh, you know relevance to him uh, uh, the fact is though that he's still very obscure you're not going to find as we've said much primary uh, uh, much in the way of primary sources of him on on him in English but one can hope that in the immediate future this might be changed and there might be some recognition for this really weird thinker uh, thank you very much uh, everyone for listening and I hope you've enjoyed it and that it hasn't been too long and boisterous. Thank you.